what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast, the daily podcast where we break down Mad Max one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we are talking about Minute 89, which begins with Max dragging Johnny by his ankle, and it ends with Johnny pleading with Max. And we are joined once again by Mr. Alex Robinson from the Star Wars Minute. Hey everybody, it's me, Alex (laughs) Robinson from Star Wars Minute. Let's say, we're so glad you've stuck with us all this time and that you haven't, you know, gotten tired of us or anything. I have stuck with you, that is true. As I, <laughs> and I promise we do not have you handcuffed by the ankle to an overturned ute. That is not how mm. we operate, and that is definitely not what has happened. <laughs> I think you're promising me that. <laughs> I wouldn't already realize that. I'm just trying to reassure the listeners is all. Mm. You know, make sure that... You know, they, they've they heard me on this podcast a whole lot, so I'd like to think I have all that trust built up so they just accept on good faith whatever I say. Right, Rick, whatever you say. Yeah, we wouldn't want any weird tweets getting out. <laughs> so we start off this minute with, with Max taking a couple steps around Johnny, who has just affixed a handcuff around his own ankle. And the one thing that really stands out about this minute as we finally get to see Max head to toe walking around is that he is moving remarkably well for a guy who got his kneecap shot off. I think that does support the hypothesis that it's not the next day that some time has passed Mm -hmm. and that he has been caring for his wound, which that bandage looks really good. Mm. There is a little bit of blood on it, some soak through, so we know that it's still like an active wound. But considering he had his kneecap blown off, looks really good. Yeah. I mean, he's a little stiff. Give him that. But he is putting weight on it. Yeah. He's just not bending it. Yeah. (laughs) I just say, um, I imagine the MFP cars have pretty good first aid kits in them, wouldn't you agree? I would think so. You know, being official police vehicles, they probably need to be somewhat equipped for first aid situations. Yeah, I believe that modern police vehicles, you know, police officers have training in basic first aid. And they have basic, probably better than basic, first aid kits in their cars. Because as quickly as, you know, uh, ambulances and first responders in general, as quickly as they get up on the scene of something often it, the police are the first ones there so they can at least start doing something or they can take care of what's going on without calling an ambulance so yeah yeah that makes sense hmm. i like that it shows that he's a competent police officer that he has that skill that he took care of himself yeah it's always nice when your hero is competent and can take care of themselves mm-hmm. yeah you don't always see that you know sometimes they just make really dumb decisions I always uh, fall back on that Alfred Hitchcock quote, which where he said that the way to make an audience like a character is to have them be good at their jobs, because people like people who are good at their jobs. Yes, I like that. I've never heard that quote before, but that is amazing. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of being good at jobs, I don't know if it necessarily counts because it's not 100% acting but as Max leans down and he grabs the one end of the handcuffs he starts pulling Johnny the boy and he does this uh, just spectacular job of yelping and crying and scooting along the floor and just just like a almost like a and this is going to sound terrible like a like a whimpering puppy or something like that getting getting dragged along and I know a puppy is the last thing that Johnny is worthy to be compared to but I find it rather rather funny just to see him get dragged by the ankle here. And That's funny. I wrote down constantly yelping. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the funny thing about it, and we heard this in the crew commentary, is that all of those yelps are genuine. They aren't technically acting. And so all of this praise I heap on him probably not necessarily due to it because it's just him being in pain. <laughs> They didn't have the ability to bring in a stunt ankle for him at this point. Well, sometimes you got to suffer for your art. Yeah. And or it, use like rubber handcuffs. Exactly. <laughs> and it made for a great scene. So, mm. besides, ah, 
Tim Burns. I haven't seen him in much other than as Johnny the Boy, but in the behind the scenes documentary, he seems to be the type of actor who is in it for the art and he didn't necessarily participate in some of the shenanigans that went on behind the scenes, the the friendly getting into character, having a good time type of stuff. He was there because he's an artist. So he seems the type who would be willing to do a little bit of suffering for his art to elevate his performance. Yeah, you definitely get the sense that members of the crew and maybe other members of the cast didn't necessarily appreciate that because when he gets handcuffed to to this overturned ute, the crew at one point went to lunch and they left him there. Yes, For like an hour and a half at least of him just sitting in this field next to this overturned truck. With his ankle changed. Well, they, didn't, they didn't leave the saw there. No, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. Have, they hadn't done that shot yet. They were just tired of him. Tired of listening <laughs> of him. Listening to him. Seeing his face, and they just left him there while they all went to lunch. I like to think they at least gave him some lunch. Maybe he was in a f- field full of grass. If he wanted, he if he was hungry, he could just nibble at the grass a little. Okay, bit. that's vegetables, right? Yes, it counts. Greens. I don't know something. <laughs> if it doesn't have protein, I usually ignore it. So Max drags Johnny around to kind of the rear suspension bars there and just takes the other end of the handcuff and just whoop, right around those suspension bars and just locks him right on there. And this whole time, Johnny's like, hey, listen, listen to me. Listen, will you listen? It's like he's the fairy from Legend of Zelda, just constantly trying to get Max's attention. And he's having none of it. And it's great. Yeah, since the moment that Max came upon this scene... He's not listening to Johnny. Johnny is talking and Max does not care. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care what Johnny has to say. He doesn't want to hear about mitigating circumstances or excuses. He just, yeah, he's having none of it. I love that. Uh, He, uh, I gotta say, analyzing this minute, I muted it because I did not want to listen to Johnny. (laughs) He's so obnoxious in this scene, constantly talking Usually, dialogue in this movie is so sparse that when there is dialogue, I like latch on to it and I dig into it and I... But this one, yeah, I muted it. I didn't care. It added no value to the scene. I think it's it's there. The value that it adds to the scene is so that Max can ignore it. Yeah, I guess it adds to the tension of the scene is him pleading and whining and stuff, but Max just not even paying any attention to it. Yes. And as mm, I don't... I don't love that I compared this Max's plan to like an evil mastermind plan, but this is how you do that. This is how you capture the good guy and you enact your evil plan. You don't listen to what that per your captive has to say and you just go about your business of killing them and taking over the world. You just do it. You don't monologue about it. You don't hum and mm-hmm. haw. You just do it. And so I I love this. I I love that Max just ignores him and sets up his trap and he's got his plan and he's doing it. Mm -hmm. All of the most effective leaders are like that. They just cut the fat and they're just like, do it. Yes. (laughs) So do it. Exactly. Um, So Max attaches Johnny to the ute and then he kind of steps over him. And Julie, I don't know if you noticed the way he steps over Johnny, he kind of puts one leg past him, and then he swings that other leg that he can't necessarily bend right past Johnny's face, which yes. is a very similar move that Goose did to Johnny when Johnny was in custody. Johnny was kind of That's chained right. up, sitting in a corner, and Goose sat on a desk and swung his feet up and Johnny right in had front of to, Johnny's face. like, pull back just a little bit to be a more comfortable distance from the foot in his face. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did not catch that. And if you'll notice in this same shot, you can clearly see... That Johnny has his tattoo. That Johnny has his tattoo now. So. I'm disappointed that the tattoos didn't end up being a storyline. Yeah. So we we talked about the tattoos recently when Max was interrogating the Grease Rat. The idea that every fully initiated member of this motorcycle gang has a little Greek F tattooed somewhere either on their face or neck. And Mm -hmm. Johnny, the boy, has not had this tattoo for the entire movie up until the point that Jim Goose is killed because Jim Goose is Johnny's initiation kill into the gang. And so 
I can appreciate Johnny opting for the neck tattoo because it's a little less ridiculous than the face tattoo. Yeah. I think when you talk about areas that could be tattooed, you want to avoid the face. The neck is not necessarily recommended. Arms, torso, back, legs, more acceptable. But, you know, maybe just don't go with the face and neck if you want to, well, like, have a desk job, which I don't think he, well, he's going to have. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. But if you feel like society is already collapsing, if I was like, hey, you know what? Five years from now, we're all going to be, uh, you know, uh, living in a place where we're all fighting over gasoline and so on. I would totally commit to the face tattoo. <laughs> then it would make you look more like a bad butt if you had a face tattoo. People would be more intimidated by you. It would help you in the post-apocalyptic world. Especially if Toe Cutter's gang had continued along the path of power mm -hmm. yeah. that they were on for most of this movie that tattoo could be quite valuable mm. and displayed prominently could be a huge asset i say because we definitely recognize in later installments of the mad max theories the power of symbols yes. i think it's a big part of fury road the whole cult of the v8 symbol with the the flaming ring with the little skull in the middle and you know, we've kind of co-opted that symbol. We've taken the skull out. We've put the microphone in for our little flag emblem there. But, you know, symbols like something as subtle as a little Greek F can be super easy to replicate. So as far as, like, tagging territory, they could have been done that very effectively, very quickly. I mean, they're already in the habit of doing that maneuver where... They'll hop on the motorcycle, they'll burn a circle in the road, and then put a line through it, which is essentially a Greek F. So they've already started tagging areas that they frequent and jobs that they've done. Yeah, I wish that the idea of the tag and the idea of, that ta of the tattoo had been in the storyline more prominently. And not just brought up after all of this stuff happens. Yes. I mean, the only reason that we ever noticed this was because we were going minute by minute and analyzing. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a fantastic detail that builds the world up. Well, isn't that kind of like what um, the, all the Mad Max movies do, that they have this deep kind of little details and stuff that they don't really give you any information about, but that, you know, you know George Miller and his crew have all, like, uh, you know, worked out? Isn't that their whole gimmick? Yeah, there's or always little details hidden around characters. Like, we may not have full wikipedia pages dis describing the life and times of everybody but there are so many just clues that people can work off of so many little details that are you know part of their outfits or their props that they carry around that just add that hidden depth that we never really have officially expanded and speaking of props one of the things that Johnny always carries around is a lighter on a little string around his neck. And Max is pretty quick to reach down and pull that off of Johnny's necklace. And it's an interesting little thing because this is like the third time we've seen it. The, the first time we saw this lighter, it was when Johnny was staked out watching Goose's motorcycle before the whole lighting him on fire thing. Yes. But he was sitting there watching Goose leave in the morning and he pulled out this lighter and he kind of held it up against his arm just to see how long he could hold his arm against the flame. Which was no time at all. It was like very was. quick. And then he like blew on his arm and started rubbing it. Yeah. And then we saw it again a couple scenes later when Toe Cutter was standing with Johnny next to the overturned ute and they were, Toe Cutter wanted Johnny to light Goose on fire. The lighter came out again and then Toe Cutter made him use a match instead. And so it's been established that this is kind of Johnny's prop. Yes. And so I find it interesting that it is ultimately going to be the thing that, that does him in. Yes. Hmm. I think it's a classic Chekhov's gun. <laughs> it, was, it was introduced, we were reminded of it, and mm. now it is put to use. Yeah. Isn't it like the rule, rule thirds? There yeah. you go. I was just about to, <laughs> to mention that. <laughs> we're on the same wavelength. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, before, I, I also want to point out... That Johnny is a big old baby about the necklace being ripped off his neck. Yeah. Just like he's a big old baby when he when he tests his his uh his uh pain threshold with the lighter and his threshold is zero. Well his threshold is still zero. Yeah, Max rips the string and he's like, ow, oh. and he like rubs his neck because it hurt. <laughs> oh, and I think it's at this point that Johnny switches his narrative from listen to me. 
to what are you doing? He's like the the sassy gay friend from uh, those internet videos several yes. years back. What are you doing? What 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 are you doing? And of course, Max doesn't answer him, but that's like the general thesis that he's going on at this point. I want to find out what is going on. Not that it avails him anything like that. But I love this next sequence because Max takes Johnny's lighter and he kind of walks around to the bed of the ute and he sits down on a tire. And I feel like this is the... This is the MacGyver portion of this scene where he is now going to construct this Rube Goldberg-esque contraption of a timed explosive so that he can really torture Johnny. I have a question and this may, I I, I don't know how this is going to sound, but so he, he sets up the broken headlight to collect the gasoline leaking. And once the gasoline starts collecting in the headlight, you can see that it's like, it's pink ish like reddish pinkish Mm -hmm. is gasoline reddish pinkish i think gasoline is tinted so that way it doesn't look 100 percent like water okay because i i never thought it was like perfectly clear although it does look perfectly clear um like when they were showing the the leak in last minute Mm -hmm. it did look like it was clear in that bit Yeah. yeah so i was a little i just noticed that all of a sudden it's not clear yeah all of the instances of them showing you know running gasoline they're just using dyed water like in the behind the scenes they talk about yeah this is just water so that they're not actually covering people in gasoline but yeah it is like tinted okay like like a slight pink color so that it really stands out when you see more of it so in real life what color is gasoline then pretty much the same color as far as i know like pinkish reddish like like a very pale pinkish reddish okay like I've got, I've had it, I've been filling up my motorcycle at the pump and sometimes I'll try and get all the way up to the brim and I'll like spill over a little bit. And yeah, for the most part, it's fairly clear, but it does have just that little bit of coloring to it. Okay. Probably a byproduct of the stuff that they add to it right. to make it smell so bad. It feels silly asking, but when you think about it, when do you ever actually see gasoline? Yeah. If you only ever it's fill such your an car. Im- <laughs> right. It, it's such an important part of our lives. But I never actually see it. Hmm. So I don't know what color it is, which makes me feel kind of stupid. But I have a good defense. There you go. There you go. Yeah. For some reason, they don't install little windows on the side of cars so you can see the gas going into the tank. Probably for the best, considering that you don't want a direct line available for fire to go through. No. You know, as we're going to see in several minutes, we don't actually get, we don't actually get the payoff for all of this minute until next week until next week unfortunately Mm -hmm. but sometimes the journey is the important part i think in this scene the journey is the important part certainly and i love just how max is able to sit down take inventory of what he has and just start putting something together yep and this whole time johnny is talking about how he's a psychopath so that excuses his behavior Mm mm-hmm We've seen before in this movie, people that are trying to influence others, they will start with one line of thought, and then when that line of thought fails, they'll switch to another one. Yes. And when that one fails, they'll switch to another one. So he started off trying to explain himself, and when that didn't work, now then he moved into, hey, what are you doing? And when he didn't get a response there, he started to try and justify his actions based on... His mental health. His mental health. So he talks about how, you know, I'm sick, see, I'm, what do you call it, a psychopath, you know, personality disorder. The court man, he said so. I appreciate that line because back when he was in court for raping that woman, we had issue with how he got off so easily. And maybe this is one of the reasons he got off so easily is because the court declared him a psychopath mm. which that i why they released him back to the public i don't know but the whole thing's a little messed up uh so i kind of like that he mentioned that it, it kind of gives a little bit more detail and explanation to something that happened an hour ago yeah because a psychopath is specifically a person suffering from chronic mental disorder with abnormal or violent social behavior so they might have only seen his behavior as abnormal and rather antisocial as opposed to full-on violent because Johnny doesn't have it in him to be a violent 
criminal. He is a follower. He is a lackey. He is one that will just follow orders because the powerful person that is influencing him says so. Yes, and the the violent crime that he does commit is one of convenience. Mm -hmm. He's got this woman tied up, so it makes it easy. Yeah, plus he's... Not so much acting on orders at that point, but he's trying to impress the other people around him. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's in a situation surrounded by really tough, intimidating people, and he needs to do something to gain favor in their eyes. And so he does this horrible thing. And now that he's alone, he just lacks the backbone. It kind of reminds me of like in the movie... Um... <clears throat> Like Clockwork, I guess we see this in a lot of places, but it reminded me of Clockwork Orange, how mm. um, the main character, Alex, is kind of this, obviously, psychopathic guy, but he can kind of, when it suits him, he can kind of turn on being like, please, sir, I'm a victim of society, you know, like, I'm just a, you know, poor boy, nobody loves me. Like, he can he can kind of use the language of the law to, and, and the, the of people who are sympathetic to him, making excuses and kind of try to lean on that a bit more but uh, clearly doesn't work with uh, old maxi no certainly not max is far beyond any sort of reasoning so to speak um let's see oh i have in my notes something i wanted to say for our listeners benefit uh the tv show macgyver that i referenced earlier did not go on the air on american television until 1985 a full six years after mad max released in australian theaters so when I said this is the MacGyver portion, I should have just said that this is the Max being creative portion, and then MacGyver, who came later, just did a whole series of Mad Maxing. <laughs> being creative with his resources, so to speak. Makes sense. Putting So, Matt, this scene was the inspiration for MacGyver, perhaps. I would say, this scene was inspiration for a lot of things. Um, and I'll definitely get into that more tomorrow. As far as people who have watched this scene have gone on to make other things just because they're so inspired by the <laughs> the desperation in Johnny's voice and the coldness in Max's demeanor. Just the whole idea that this awful situation is unfolding and that there's very little that Johnny can do about it. You know, there's there's few ways for him to get a leg up on the situation. Wow. <laughs> you know, is that... Yeah. <laughs> trying to think of other limb removing puns but i don't know they're not coming to me <laughs> <laughs> so we don't actually get to see the entirety of max's contraption until tomorrow either so with so much to look forward to let's wrap up today so that we can come back tomorrow to wrap up the week see what max is able to to whip up and ultimately leave johnny to his fate so Alex, we've had a great time having you. We're looking forward to having you again tomorrow. In the meantime, where can people find more of you? Well, if Twitter is the thing you enjoy doing, I have good news. I'm also on Twitter. I'm that other guy who's on Twitter. <laughs> uh, A Rob Twit is my handle, A R O B T W I T. And uh, there you go. I uh, will occasionally late at night post uh, despairing tweets. So uh, if that sounds fun, check it out. <laughs> And of course, our website is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute. Like us on Facebook and join our listeners page, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. Thank you for joining us for Mad Max Minute number 89. We'll see you tomorrow. Motorbikes and men. Take me to the end of the dream. Hold on.